You've probably seen lots of videos on tips for medical school interviews, but you don't know how to actually apply those tips because they're not being used in actual questions for you. That's why in this video, we're going to go over three questions and they cover the three types of questions that you'll see in your medical school interview. And what's more is we're gonna provide full model answers for each of these questions. During each response, we'll also provide on-screen feedback so that you know exactly why we're saying what we're saying. For context, we're going to be answering the question like we're in an MMI. And if you guys don't know what an MMI is, be sure to check out our previous videos. That means our answers are going to be about 5 minutes. We'll also point out what you can expand on or cut out during your interview. This is so that if your interview is longer or shorter, you can adjust accordingly. Now for these next 15 minutes, let's lock in and pretend we are in an MMI. Question 1. Describe a situation where you dealt with a high pressure situation. What did you learn from the experience? A time when I dealt with a high pressure situation was as the head instructor at Kumon, an institution designed to teach math and reading to students of all ages. The time in question was when the center was past its student capacity. This was because many students had booked their time slot at the same time and those currently in the center were staying past their allotted time. This was stressful for my team and I because we were making sure that these students were out of the center on time to accommodate for more students. But it was difficult to do this because of how many students there were. Being in a position of seniority, I was feeling really stressed as many students were coming up to me asking for where to sit and the junior tutors were noticeably frustrated at the volume overload. Not only that, my assistants were asking me to take on additional work, but I was already busy with managing some of the administrative duties involved with admitting students into the center. However, I quickly recognized that in order to manage this pressure effectively, I first needed to detach from the situation and not let my emotions control my actions. It would have been easy for me to get frustrated, but I knew that if I did this, I would be setting a bad example for the rest of the team, and we would ultimately be neglecting our duties. So, the first step I took to managing the pressure was to speak with my supervisor about how I was feeling over the phone, and after talking to her, I immediately felt more relaxed. Upon venting to her about our situation, I cleared my mind and also realized that I needed to work with my team here in order to effectively manage the situation. So I took some time to observe the workflow of the center and conveyed to my junior tutors ways in which they could make their teaching much more efficient so as to ensure that we could get these students out on time while preserving the quality of teaching, as we would not want to compromise this at any cost. For example, I noticed that the tutors were not playing uh, to their strengths. The ones suited to younger ages were dealing with those that were older due to the influx of students. Therefore, I delegated tasks more equally amongst my junior tutors, but made sure that the tutors were taking on students they could adequately manage. And I took on the role of assisting students with their individual errors to further optimize their system. I also emphasized the importance of communication during this time. Whenever someone was feeling overwhelmed, I made sure to redistribute the task accordingly. Because of our approach to the situation and ability to stay calm under pressure, we were able to manage the workload well and implement my system moving forward. From the situation, I learned the importance of resilience when faced with a lot of pressure. It's really easy to fold, but I remained calm, relied on others in my time of need, and in doing so, forged a system that relied on a high level of communication and expertise in order to work. There will be many times as a potential physician where I will be faced with high pressure situations. After all, patient care is fast paced and when making critical diagnoses, a lot of responsibility falls on healthcare providers. That's where resilience comes in. Being resilient will allow you to deal with high pressure situations in a systematic and logical manner. Key to preventing your emotions from getting the best of you in these times. The way you practice resilience in healthcare is by relying on your colleagues and talking to them when things are out of your expertise, by developing a plan before addressing the situation, and most importantly of all, maintaining proper communication with those involved in this situation. In conclusion, dealing with overloaded capacity in our teaching situation as a head instructor at Kumon, I've learned to be more resilient and I will carry this forward into medicine in order to provide high quality patient care and uplift my healthcare team as a leader. Did you like that answer? We made a 20 page document that has everything you need to know for the medical school interviews you have this cycle. It has tips, practice questions, 
and answers. Find it in the link in our description. Now back to the video. Question two, what are the pros and cons of medical assistance in dying? And what is your opinion on the matter? Medical assistance in dying or MAID is something that's highly controversial and highly talked about in today's time. My understanding is that MAID is when patients can die with the help of a healthcare provider, um, given they meet the certain criteria that's laid out by the laws in their country. So there are many pros and many cons for either side of allowing the practice, but I'm going to start off with the pros. The first pro is that it allows these people who are going through so much suffering to end their lives in a safe way. People who are going through these diseases or have terminal illnesses look for ways to end their life. And if there is no safe way to do it, they move on to unsafe practices. What are these unsafe practices, for example? Number one, it's suicide. Suicide can be quite traumatic. It can be something like trauma. It could be from a gun. It could be from suicide from hanging. So it can be quite traumatic for both the person who is dying, who is already in so much pain, but also their family members. In addition, there's also a lot of made travel that goes on. People travel to other countries where made is legal and get this process done that way by spending so much money and again causing a lot of suffering to their own loved ones. If it's available in our country, then this would be available to people and it would be a safe and also affordable way for people to end their suffering. So because of that, that is definitely a pro. What's the second pro? When people are going through these terminal illnesses and when they have conditions that can't be treated, they feel like they are losing their autonomy. They have no control over their lives. They don't know when's going to be their last day on this planet. And for this reason, MAID brings back some of that autonomy that they're losing by putting that decision in their hands. Obviously, there's a criteria that they have to meet, but once that criteria is met, patient autonomy is something that's really important, especially in the Canadian healthcare system, and that's given back to them through the process of MAID. So now, what are the cons? So the first con is that MAID can become a slippery slope. We're starting off with terminal illnesses or untreatable disorders, but what if it moves on to something else? There was recently a case where someone applied for MAID because they couldn't afford in these very expensive cities in Canada. Now, is that a valid way to move forward with MAID? Some can argue that that is. Some would argue that it's absolutely not. No matter what we say about either situation, all I'm saying is that the slippery slope can extend over and over again to a place where young people can start getting MAID or people with diseases that are not untreatable start getting MAID. And this can cause real problems in both society and the healthcare field. So we have to be really, really careful about that. Moreover, another con of this is that maybe because MAID is becoming so accessible and it's becoming so famous, the research that goes into curing these untreatable illnesses is going to deteriorate. For this reason, we will not find the cures that we might have found if we were appropriately allocating resources to these diseases instead of putting people in line for MAID. This can cause a lot of harm because maybe that disease can be treated. A disease like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, which has no cure right now, would not have any utility to have any research done after. And this can be really bad because maybe in 50 years we do come up with a cure and then MAID isn't needed. So for this reason, research will be drastically impacted by MAID if um, that's put in. So in this case, and if I had to give my own opinion, I feel like the pros outweigh the cons. I feel like that there are more advantages of allowing MAID than, making, than actually keeping it from the public. However, we also have to address the cons. We can't just disregard the cons and keep moving forward with the pros. So what can we do? First of all, there needs to be a very strict criteria that has to be met to be allowed to do MAID. You cannot allow anyone to do it and we must stop the slippery slope from happening. How do we do this? We have regulators from various fields and we make sure that they're extremely strict with their guidelines and it does not open up for anyone. In addition, we also make sure that the research continues to happen and MAID isn't a barrier to this research that should be happening. So all in all, what I would say is that there are pros and there are cons of MAID right now, but given the current circumstances, the pros outweigh the cons and for that reason, it should be allowed. Question three. Your colleague, Dr. Lee, recommends homeopathic medicine to his patients. There's no scientific evidence or widely accepted theory that homeopathic medicine works, and Dr. Chung doesn't believe them to. 
He recommends homeopathic medicine to patients with nonspecific or mild symptoms like fatigue or muscle aches. And he believes that this medicine does no harm, but instead gives them reassurance. What would you do in this situation? My understanding of the question is that I am a colleague of Dr. Lee's and he's prescribing homeopathic medications to patients for these less low urgency symptoms. And he actually doesn't have any evidence to suggest that these homeopathic medications work, yet he's still prescribing them. So I'm asked what I would do in this case. This is a really complex situation, and I'm going to start by outlining the main conflict, then delving into the different perspectives to gain a better understanding, and that's going to inform the decision I'm going to make at the end. So first, the main conflict, I believe, is between Dr. Lee's medical judgment and his prowess as a physician versus the well-being of these patients as well as the trust they might have in the medical system. From the perspective of Dr. Lee, as I mentioned, he's a physician and he's obviously trying his best to help these people. Well, these homeopathic medications, in his opinion, might be appropriate because these are low urgency symptoms. They're nothing crazy like that could be suggestive of some, some malignancy or some cancer, which could be far more severe. However, the main issue with his actions is that he's not practicing evidence-based medicine, which is very integral to the functioning of our healthcare system. Evidence-based medicine is all about making sure that the care that doctors are providing is in line with current research. After all, we want to make sure that the treatment we're providing is actually backed by research and evidence. The homeopathic medications don't yet have enough evidence to suggest that they're effective. It's not to say that they won't be, but they just don't have much evidence. From the perspective of the patients, this can be a serious violation in the trust they might have in their doctor. If they were to find out that Dr. Lee's prescribing them homeopathic medications that may not actually have any effect on their symptoms, this might cause them to not come back to the doctor because they might not trust that they're providing them with the care that they want. Although these patients' symptoms might be managed by something less invasive than the patients might want, sometimes these symptoms could be indicative of something way worse. For example, feeling really tired all the time could be a symptom of something very severe that's going on in your body. And prescribing someone a homeopathic medication might actually delay the treatment that they are receiving in the future. This means that if, for example, if it's some type of cancer, it's gonna be caught a lot later on and this could potentially reduce the prognosis for these patients another aspect of this is the fact that homeopathic medications are just not researched enough in terms of their interactions with other drugs for example if these patients are taking over-the-counter medications and Dr. Lee prescribes some homeopathic medications they might actually have a negative interaction with these medications making the symptoms worse this is kind of based on the placebo effect in general, but there is a chance that these patients come back because the, patient, the actual medications don't work. So what will Dr. Lee do then? I think all this information generally informs my approach, which is to actually have a private conversation with Dr. Lee to figure out exactly why he's prescribing these medications. I think it's personally wrong to do this because you're violating patient trust and you're actually delaying the care that they might need in the future. Although you're doing this to relieve them of potentially low urgency symptoms, it's still not right. That's why I would have a private conversation with Dr. Lee in a non-judgmental manner. I would also try and sort of figure out what's going on. And upon having this conversation, if I have reason to believe that, you know, he was potentially ignorant of the fact that uh, of the damage that the homeopathic medications could do, I would sort of provide him with more resources on how he can practice safe and better medical care. However, if I have reason to suspect that he doesn't actually have any uh, indication as to preventing the prescription of the homeopathic medication, as in he doesn't, he wants to continue doing that, in that case, I would unfortunately have to, you know, let him know that this is not right and I would potentially uh, speak to some upper, upper higher authority on this matter, maybe my colleagues as well. I also don't want to ruin Dr. Lee's reputation as a physician, but because of the danger that he's putting his patients in by prescribing these medications, I would have to let other people know. And I would ultimately let Dr. Lee know that all I'm doing is trying to make sure that I am uh, a good physician and I don't want to be an accomplice on this matter as well. I don't want to hide the fact from the public or anything like that. 
So in general, we discussed a few important ethical discussions and ethical issues as well. And I think the main thing to take away here is the fact that we have to value evidence-based medicine as physicians and not betray our patients by providing them with care that may not be in line with what they want. So this promotes patient autonomy. And this brings us to the end of this week's video. If you have a medical school interview coming up, make sure you check out all of our videos on interview prep and also our resources on Etsy because I guarantee they will help you. Good luck. See you guys next time.